part of the moonshot thinking is about being just insane enough to try something no one else has done yet, but not so insane that it, you can't get a few people to believe it might actually be possible. I've got some great photos of my favorite places. This is one of our data centers in uh, Iowa. If you have a look at the Google Data Center images, or do a search for Google Data Center images, you see some beautiful, beautiful images. Uh, kind of nerd glamour pictures. I don't know what you, what, how you describe them, but you know, not all data centers look like that, and I'm pretty sure they install the colored LEDs just for the photographers, but they are, they are rather beautiful. Um, we don't do boiler, boilerplate data centers. If you have a look at every Intel factory or office is identical. They're amazing for, for process. You've seen it in Ikea, right? You've been in one Ikea store, you've been in all of them. But Google data centers are different because we tailor them for their environment. Um, we have a new one up in Hamina, that's about a year and a half old now, I suppose, where we went into a Finnish paper mill. It was one of the largest paper mills in the world, an enormous, enormous facility. And we decided, well, this is a good location. We have loads of hydroelectric power. Um, we have lots of space. This is a big, big, giant building. But the other part of data centers, of course, is cooling. So what do we do? The Baltic Sea, turns out it's really cold, always. But this water, it pumps around the data center. It leaves it then at a quarter degree warmer than it came in, so the fish don't seem to mind. Um, but that's an incredibly cheap way of cooling the data center. I think something like 3 to 4% of the energy that we burn on servers gets used by the cooling systems. In a normal data center, it can be up to 100%. So for every kilowatt of power your server uses, it could be a kilowatt of cooling. In these data centers, when you've got the Baltic Sea and you're just moving cool water around or you're using evaporative chillers from cheap local uh, canal water, you can get ridiculously efficient data centers. Of course, you have to build them large for this. In Dublin, um, it's a slightly different data center. Uh, we have a unique climate there where it's always cool and moist. Uh, so we just got a big fan on the side of the building. No chillers, no evaporation, no seawater. It's just a fan, and it's fine. Um, it does mean, apparently, I've been told that if the data center gets over 27 degrees or something like that, sorry, if Dublin gets over 27 degrees, we'll have to shut the data center down. But that's fine. It'll never happen. Um, I, I, it kind of sounds funny, but it's true. It turns out that if you have enough large data centers, you can take these calculated risks. You can say, for those 15 minutes a decade that the Met Office have told us you know, it gets over 27 degrees, that's cool. We'll shut it down for the 15 minutes, shift processing over to uh, you know, a German data center or a Belgian or a uh, Finnish data center, and everything will be fine. No one will notice. The Google Firebird to the Home project couldn't have happened if we hadn't done an awful lot of this high-end networking research. So it turns out that you build a few dozen data centers, you fill them full of uh, high-end networking. Um, there's a lot of extra spin-offs, the moonshot type thinking we were talking about earlier. Um, and it turns out fiber to the home, there's a lot of the similar challenges. How do you get 100 gigabits of network from Kansas City to the nearest data center where you've got uh, a giant internet backbone? And it turns out a lot of that kind of metro um, Network stuff that we're working on was very, very useful there. Of course, we, we are also very used to buying commodity hardware. We deploy you know, more high-end um, routers than, I don't know, anyone I've ever come across, that's for sure. I thought when I saw this, it was a joke, and then I got to see the building where it was built. Um, every pipe here, the plumber knows exactly where it goes. And plumber is a, my term for the, the uh, hydraulic engineers. These kind of water systems, this dark blue is cold water coming from something like a canal or the Baltic Sea. Green water then would be the slightly warmer water going back to the Baltic Sea. And then red water, or the red pipes would be the super warm water coming from the data centers uh, and the likes. OK, so this is um, an interesting project. One of the uh, engineers in the Chicago office, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, he's a bit of a, a crazy genius. Um, and he realized that there was a, a, Google had a perception problem. A few years ago, people were saying, I'm giving my, my data to Google. I'm putting it into the cloud. How do we know it's going to come back? We wanted to make sure our users can get our data out. I think one of the first targets was AdWords. He went in and said, look, we want to make sure that our, anyone who has a Google Ads campaign can take all their data out and move it to a competitor. And now they have, I think, 13, 14 projects. They're hoping to get every single Google product where you can just go to takeout and you click, give me a zip file of all of my data in a format that's nice and standard, and I can move that somewhere else. One of the t products my team kind of support as well is um, um, disk arrays. We make sure that any disk leaves our data center, you know, if it's broken or it's old or whatever, we make absolutely sure your data is not on it. Um, 
the value of you know, somebody accidentally buying a disk on eBay with Google data on it or Gmail or even if it was encrypted or whatever would be incalculable. So every product, when it stores data on disk, it encrypts it. The storage system, sorry, it, gives it, to, it encrypts it, gives it to the storage system, which encrypts it and sticks it on disk, which encrypts it. Uh, and then the disk is tracked. So every, every drive in Google, we know exactly where it is and, and what's on it and when it was last seen. Um, and the idea is that if we then leave a data center or imagine we turn off 20, 20 racks of equipment and we're going to release the machines or you know, sell them on, replace them with, with the most latest, greatest technology, we want to make absolutely sure that every disk is going to be wiped um, and then it's verified and then it's moved into a separate area and it's wiped and it's verified. And uh, we're even so paranoid that the software will be written by two different t teams for the, you know, the first step and the second step, just in case you come across a bug that you accidentally forgot to wipe the same disk twice. Um, and if we can't verify a disk, imagine it's, the hardware is not quite right, and it, it says, yeah, I think I've wiped it, but I can't remember, um, then it's pneumatically crushed, and then it, there's big, big shredders. So any drive that we definitely are not 100%, sorry, any drive that we are not 100% sure your data's gone from, it gets uh, stamped like that, and then it can leave the data center floor where it gets turned into these cool little two millimeter sized uh, pellets for recycling. And then it can leave the data center. One of the other things we think about on the site reliability team, which is the kind of the part of engineering that I'm most familiar with, um, we think about worst case scenarios. No one noticed, no one should ever notice. Doesn't matter how big the disaster is, no one will notice that anything has happened to Google. Uh, the things I've learned in my days in Google I've learned that sharks, they have uh, electric sensors in their nose. They can sense electric signals from miles off. Do you know what has electric signals deep underwater? Submarine cables. So they have, uh, they have you know, stupendously high voltage uh, cables running alongside the fiber optic cables to amplify the signal. Every so often there's a, a repeater station. And sharks can smell these. And uh, well, what do sharks do, right? They bite. Um, so occasionally they'll find a line, just go, nom, 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 bite, get hit by 50,000 volts, go elsewhere for a while. But in the meantime, your fiber optic cable is cut, and maybe you then have reduced capacity transatlantic or across the Mediterranean or wherever you're most inconvenienced, because these things always happen at the worst time. We're also really paranoid, right? It turns out that it doesn't matter how reliable and redundant you make one specific data center, no one's going to help you when you drop a spanner into the UPS bus bar and the whole thing explodes. So Google actually designed their data centers to be not quite as reliable as the rest of the world. Um, we just assume it's going to fail, and every application developer in Google is told, we don't care how big your application is going, can you make sure you can withstand one data center dying? And they go, yeah, yeah, definitely, and they'll put it in two. And say, so, yeah, you also have to have one data center will die unexpected, and one will take down for maintenance. And they go, mm, what about three? Okay, great. Now, are they on the same continent? It's like, well, yeah. Okay, you got to assume that someday one of those continents is going to be hit by an asteroid. Um, and the software engineer does get really annoyed and says, screw it, I'll just write it for App Engine. Um, and that's, that's what we're doing internally, and um, it seems to be working quite well. This is one of my little personal favorites. If you go to any ISP in the world, you can ask them and say, how much money do you spend on YouTube usually? And they'll probably answer with like, <laughs> so we had a, a solution, and that was to contact them and say, well, it turns out we've got a Google global cache node in your city. Uh, we'll run a, you know, if you run a cable to that, you can send all of your YouTube traffic straight to that. And this is, this is, you know, saves so much money. Um, but not just that, it also gets videos much, much closer to the users. So you're no longer doing, uh, you know, Australia would be a great example. Uh, getting <clears throat> YouTube in Australia all the way from California, that's really, really slow. So if they can cache the, even the 20% most popular videos. And this gets stuff to the users cheaply, quickly, and efficiently. Hope is not a strategy was one of the first mottos I came across in the site reliability team because we were asked, you know, will that work? And someone had said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we hope it'll work. And it's, you know, no, no, you need to be ultra paranoid. Um, we, we handle all of these and there's no big deal. And when, I, when people say, well, what's the thing about the cloud? It's about using specialists and professionals who know what they're doing who won't screw up. Because do you know what? If we look after email for 700 million odd people or whatever it is these days, and none of those people ever remembers any of their email getting wiped, that's pretty good. And I think, again, this shows the power of the cloud, where if you have so many engineers that have no be nothing better to do with their time than think of all the evil that other people could do and defend against it, um, we're living in a wonderful world. We're